Okay, well, so first of all, this, it's good to be back. I am 75% as wise as I used to be. Um, this is not a theological takeaway in any way. This is just observations. And, and gratitude, though. I mean, praise the Lord. It went amazingly well, my wisdom tooth removal. last It was last Friday, so that's a week and two days ago. And the... Um, we tried to find a dentist. I didn't want to be put to sleep for it. It seemed unnecessary and excessive, and you can look up the potential health risks of doing that and so on. So, found a dentist that would do it at a really good price, and he didn't use general anesthesia. He only used local anesthesia. So anyway, um, that wound up quite a process. My wife said I was back there for like an active surgery for probably like an hour and a half. Two hours, but I don't think that was all active surgery. That was when I was back there. But long time, regardless. And he was drilling and cutting and, you know, breaking out all sorts of stuff. Well, um... And you were awake for all that? I was awake for the whole thing, yeah. And listening to him talk to his assistant, okay, now I'm going to make a cut here. Make a cut here. So, good psychological exercise. But, um, but it went great. And I took, um, after the, the local anesthesia, I took ibuprofen on the way home. And that was the last painkiller I took for any of it, which is amazing. I was just really thankful for how well and how painlessly the, the whole thing went. And then, Friday night freaked me out. I, was, I allowed myself to chew on that side. Not, not that Friday night. I'm talking about this Friday night. So a week later, <laughs> allowed myself to really just kind of eat normally for the first time. I mean, still carefully. Then I went and looked in the mirror, and the clot was gone. There's like a cavern in my back jaw. <laughs> and so, the, so dentists apparently, I don't know why this, they give you all the aftercare instructions, but they apparently don't tell you, by the way, in about a, you know, don't get a dry socket in the next three to five days. You don't want your clot to fall out. But in about a week, it's going to come out and it's fine. They don't tell you that. Right. They just right. say, don't get dry socket. You know, don't let the clot fall out. So I look in the mirror and it's gone. And so I'm, you know, instantly in a panic. Like, gotta, what's going on? Am I, is that it? I'm going to have dry socket now? So anyway, if you ever get your tooth pulled, don't be shocked after about a week that clot is supposed to fall out. Things the dentists never tell you for some reason. <laughs> I heard you guys talking. I wish I had come out and talked to you about that because I remember when it, when I got mine pulled, they took all of them out at one time, and I had those pits in my. I thought, goodness gracious, that's you know I could pack a whole week's worth of food in there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> all those yep. spots. Yeah. It was. It was huge. So anyway. Just finding out under things I wish people had told me, you know, wish, you know, why isn't that in the aftercare instructions from the dentist? That's not theological. That was just observations. But I'm very thankful to be back and, and, and healthy and no complications and able to sing and so on. So praise the Lord. A couple of quick theological things. One, I've been thinking about, you probably heard the term wanderlust. How many of you are familiar with that term? The basic idea being... It's kind of like George Bailey in Bedford Falls, right? I want to see the world. He's going to go to London and Paris and build things. and Right. And so that you could call that wanderlust. So what is a Christian response to wanderlust? What is the Christian antidote to a heart? And, and it's not wrong to like to see the world God made. It's not wrong to like to go see the sites. There's nothing wrong with wanting to go visit Paris or the Holy Land or whatever. That's certainly not a bad thing. But discontentment is a bad thing. Discontentment is biblically a bad thing. We are called to come to Christ and lay our lives on the altar and say, I am your servant, Jesus. And if that means that I live in this house, in this neighborhood for the rest of my life, if that means that I live in, if, if I have a ministry in inner city Chicago and I never get to see, see the sights or whatever, mm -hmm. fill in the blank. That's where I'll be, and I'll be happy to be there because that's where you call me to be. So the Christian response to wanderlust is gratitude. We're called to stop thinking about what I wish I had because that gives you that puts noise in your heart. That puts idols in your heart. That puts discontentment in your heart. And it's a wonderful life. It's such a great picture of that. I know it's a Christmas movie. I'm re referring to it out of season. But it's an excellent illustration of a man who's heart is constantly pulled to this, I wish I could, I wish I could, I wish I could, and he never gets to, and it eats at him. But the solution to that 
our world's solution to that is, well, you need to chase your dreams. You need to go out there and see the sights. You need to go. But that's not the biblical solution to that. The biblical solution to that is you need to let go of those dreams. Trade your dreams for your life, for the Lord's calling on your life. And that is a trade up. That is a huge trade up. We have to live with the eyes of faith that see what I am living towards, the harvest that I am laboring for, so infinitely surpasses anything that I could wish I got to see in this life. But I'd be a fool. I'd be a fool to trade this, whatever this is, whatever God has given me to do faithfully, for that. It is not worthy to be compared. The sufferings of this present life are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So when we are in the throes of wanderlust or film discontentment would be the biblical word. The throes of discontentment. I wish I could. Oh, I wish I had. I wish I had more money. I wish I could wish I could buy my wife those pretty dresses and <laughs> whatever, fill in the blank. The response to that is thanksgiving, contentment, gratitude to the Lord. Stop, look around at what he has given. Starts with what he has given in himself, in his promises, in his word. Because even the Christian in solitary confinement, in some dark Japanese jail in, in World War II, or whatever, has enough to be thankful for, let alone us, right? Let alone us in our situations have so much to be thankful for. It starts with God, his word, his promises, and then it spreads. Yesterday was my birthday, and I was sitting there at my table. There I am, 28 years old, looking around at a wife who loves me and just wants to just make my day awesome. And kids that just, like, walked out of the Gerber Baby catalog, like, just beautiful, just so blessed, surrounded by God's blessings and a, a new house, you know, just drinking it in and thanking the Lord. That is the Christian response to, oh, I wish I could this and this and that. Starts with, I have enough in Christ. I have more than enough. And then, thank you, Lord, for all the things you've given me that I don't deserve. Thank you for three square meals. Thank you for a warm place to sleep. Thank you for, and the list goes on and on and on. When we turn our eyes away from what I can't have and onto what I have in Christ and what God has given me, that's the right focus. That's, that puts you on a path towards joy instead of a path towards whining. Like the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. They're a right. great example. Oh, I wish I could go back to Egypt. Really, guys? Really? But how, how often is that us? Oh, I wish I could. This, this life that God has given me is not good enough. Well, that's, that's a problem with us. Not a problem with him. Oh, to have the eyes to see. See the harvest. Look towards what God is building, what God is doing, the blessings that he's given us, the promises that he's made. Amen. Amen. And, and you're sharing your